Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be looking at the fabulous Lady Mary Chudley, who is an early proto-feminist writer. In particular, I'm going to be looking at her views on marriage in her poem To the Ladies, which was published in 1703 in her poems on several occasions. I think Lady Mary Chudley's poetry is a really great place to start if you're interested in 18th century women's writing and proto-feminist writings more generally because it's easily accessible which is always good, it's sharp and witty which is always good fun to read but also because the tone I think is very interesting. It's fun and playful in its hyperbole but it also retains a serious undertone and message. So it's something for you to think about as I discuss the poem, that dichotomy between playful and witty on the one hand and serious on the other. If you like my videos, then do subscribe to my channel. It means that you'll see my new weekly videos when they're uploaded and do give the video a thumbs up. It helps me out in YouTube's algorithm so that more people can see my videos. To begin, I just want to run very quickly through some biographical details of Lady Mary Chudley's life. So Lady Mary Chudley was born in the mid 17th century in 1656, that's during the Interregnum. And she lived through the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 when Charles II came to the throne, through the crisis of James II's kingship, the glorious revolution of 1688, that's when William and Mary Stuart ascended to the throne, and Lady Mary Chudley lived into the reign of Queen Anne. And Lady Mary Chudley dedicated poems on several occasions, the volume that To the Ladies was published in, to Queen Anne. And Lady Mary Chudley's dedication to Queen Anne is interesting because she calls attention specifically to the Queen's gender. So the dedication is to the Queen's most excellent majesty. And within the dedication, she writes, but to whom should a woman unknown to the world and who has not merit enough to defend her from the censure of critics fly for protection, but to your majesty? the greatest, the best, and the most illustrious person of your sex and age. Lady Mary Chudley is drawing particularly on Queen Anne's sex, so her gender. And Lady Mary Chudley expects censure from critics and looks to the most illustrious woman of the age for protection. And this is an early example of women in public life supporting and protecting other women. So if you're interested in 18th century culture about uh, coteries and about women writing about other women in public life, then Lady Mary Chudley is a really interesting woman to look at. So back to Lady Mary Chudley's biography. So when she was 18 years old only, Mary Lee, as she was then, married Sir George Chudley of Ashton in Devon in 1674. And they had six children, four of whom died before they reached adulthood. And Lady Mary Chudley worked through her grief in many of her writings. And her dedication to Queen Anne is particularly relevant here as Queen Anne had experienced at least 17 pregnancies and her only child to survive infancy was Prince William, the Duke of Gloucester, who died in 1700. So both women knew maternal grief. And the first poem in Lady Mary Chudley's poems on several occasions is about the death of the Duke of Gloucester and shows Lady Mary Chudley's sympathy with Anne as a woman and mother. And it's worth consulting if you're interested in the depiction of the role of women in the 18th century, because obviously the production of children was considered to be absolutely fundamental to the duty, to the role, to the position of woman in the period. And Anne is a really interesting figure and lots of women write interestingly about Anne, at the Queen Anne at the time, because she is both a public woman and 
a private woman experiencing this private grief personally as a as an individual woman but also the public failure essentially of her duty because she failed as a woman to produce children and continue on the royal line so although lady mary chudley wrote about maternal grief she used literature throughout her life when she was much younger too a family memoir for example states that she was ever from her infancy addicted to reading and had naturally a genius for poetry but lady mary chudley did not publish any of her writings she wrote essays as well as poetry until the last decade of her life when she was in her mid 40s that is when her children had grown up and so she had fewer duties at home and therefore more time to dedicate as she says in the preface to poems on several occasions to the amusement of her leisure hours with poetry as she phrases it there I think it's worth pointing out that Lady Mary Chudley was celebrated in her own lifetime and her works went through several editions in the 18th century. So this is from George Ballard's memoirs of several ladies of Great Britain from the mid 18th century in 1752. Her own love of books, her great industry in the reading of them and her great capacity to improve herself by them enabled her to make a very considerable figure among the literati of her time. Time. The literati of her time included John Dryden, who had been poet laureate and so clearly was part of the literary establishment, was a, clearly a, a figure who was central to the literary milieu. Dryden was impressed by her poetry and even asked his publisher if a poem of hers could be included in the second edition of his translation of Virgil from 1697. It also included Mary Astle, who's another prominent proto-feminist writer who argued for the value of women's education, with whom Lady Mary Chudley had a literary correspondence. Lady Mary Chudley's writing continued to be celebrated well into the 19th century. So, for example, in Frederick Roughton's Female Poets of Great Britain from 1853, Lady Chudley distinguished herself by her clever championship of her sex at a time when the female mind was far too little esteemed. Sometimes I think we overlook how popular women writers of the 18th century actually were because we mistake the canon for popularity and writers of the canon are usually male writers writers like milton alexander pope william wordsworth those we consider to be generally the canonical writers of the long 18th century but actually if you look at the miscellanies if you look at the anthologies many many more women writers than we might think of were actually published and were popular at the time it says more about later literary cultures, the Victorian literary culture, the early 20th century literary culture, which, generally speaking, prioritised the canon, that we have this view that women are kind of eliminated from literary history. That's really not the case in the 18th century, where many women writers were popular. This is the title page for Poems on Several Occasions, published, as you see, with her name on the title page by Lady Chudley. You'll notice also that the publisher is Bernard Lintott, who was a prominent and important 18th century publisher. It's the same publisher, for example, as Alexander Pope. All this is to say that Lady Mary Chudley was a prominent literary figure in her time. She engaged with figures of the literary establishment, Dryden, Astle, the publisher of Pope, and of course, social establishment too. She's dedicating her poems on several occasions to the Queen, the embodiment of the social establishment. So Lady Mary Chudley was not a marginal, hidden figure. She was well known in her own time and her works were frequently published during her lifetime and after her death, especially the poem that we're going to be looking at today, To the Ladies. So today I'm going to be looking at the poem To the Ladies. It clearly appealed to many readers at the time that it was published as the poem was often reprinted throughout the 18th century in anthologies and miscellanies. For example, in Poems by Eminent Ladies from 1755. You can see there Lady Chudley is listed. 
This poem also appears in many commonplace books. It's transcribed into people's own commonplace books, as they were called, which is where you would note down little scraps and little snippets that you wanted to kind of record for uh, posterity for you to go back and look at later. And the opening couplets, especially from To the Ladies, is recorded frequently, which we'll get on to look at in a bit more detail in a moment. But I want to stress that it was a very popular poem throughout the 18th century. The poem itself, as we'll look at, might seem to be arguing against the prevailing hegemony by critiquing marriage in such strong terms. But the popularity of the poem to the ladies in fact suggests that its message was not alarming or offensive to society and to the establishment. If it had been alarming and offensive and beyond the pale, then it would not have been reprinted so often. So its popularity, despite the fact that it seems to be arguing against something which is so firmly established within hegemonic culture, marriage, prompts us to consider its tone and how it was interpreted in the 18th century. And that's really something to reflect on when you're looking at texts of the past, is how these might have been perceived at the time in which they were written. Because it might be easy for us to see this poem as really challenging norms, which on the one hand it does, but at the same time, that same society whose norms it challenged accepted this poem enough for it to be as popular as it was. First, I'm going to read through the whole poem and then I'm going to break it down into a little bit more detail. To the ladies. Wife and servant are the same, but only differ in the name. For when that fatal knot is tied, which nothing, nothing can divide. When she the word obey has said, and man by law supreme has made, then all that's kind is laid aside, and nothing left but state and pride. Fierce as an eastern prince he grows, and all his innate rigour shows. Then, but to look, to laugh, or speak, will the nuptial contract break. Like mutes, she signs alone must make, and never any freedom take, but still be governed by a nod, and fear her husband as her god. Him still must serve, him still obey, and nothing act, and nothing say, but what her haughty lord thinks fit, who with the power has all the wit. Then shun, oh shun that wretched state, and all the fawning flatterers hate. Value yourselves, and men despise. You must be proud if you'll be wise. So the opening couplets, wife and servant are the same, but only differ in the name. That's what was often transcribed in the commonplace books of the 18th century and very easily aphorized couplets and so easy to kind of remove from the rest of the poem. It stands at the beginning of the poem as a statement that the rest of the poem is going to argue for. For when that fatal knot is tied which nothing, nothing can divide. That fatal knot is tied, of course, and it's an extension of the phrase tying the knot to refer to marriage. And fatal, of course, because you tie the knot until death do us part. But often, of course, marriage is seen as a celebration, as something happy. And adding the word fatal here, in fact, creates an opposite tone. It reminds you that tying the knot is irreversible. It is until death do you part. It is a fatal knot because it will continue until you die. There's no way that you can get out of it, which nothing, nothing can divide. And you'll notice there the very hard repetition for emphasis with the caesura, with the pause, which nothing, nothing can divide. When she, the word obey, has said. Obey is part of the marriage service. A woman had to say that she would love, honour and obey her husband. And obey particularly goes back to the first line, wife and servant are the same. Both have to obey their master. 
And then we move on to the social commentary. And man by law supreme has made. It was indeed law that man was supreme when a woman got married to a man. This is from Commentaries on the Law of England, published in 1765. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband under whose wing, protection and cover she performs everything. Literally, a wife did not exist in law. The legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage. You are no longer a person. You are no thing. You are nothing when you become a wife. The man, by law, is made supreme. Then all that's kind is laid aside and nothing left but state and pride. Again, we've got the repetition of the word nothing. Status is left and pride. Fierce as an eastern prince he grows and all his innate rigour shows. So we've got the idea that once man has been made supreme, he will grow fierce. He will become like a fierce prince. The word prince suggests a kind of power dynamic at play. All his innate rigour shows. So innate rigour, what was already within him. Innate. And rigour is an interesting word to pick out here. From Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language from 1755, we can see that there are many definitions of the word rigour, but they're unlike perhaps how we now use the word rigour. When we talk about rigorous, we talk about someone doing something fully and meticulously and neatly and so on. But it had some different connotations in the 18th century. So we can tell from Johnson, cold, stiffness, a convulsive shuddering with sense of cold, severity, sternness, want of condescension to others, severity of conduct, strictness, unabated exactness. And this one, I think, is crucial. Rage, cruelty, fury. And then number seven, hardness, not flexibility, solidity, not softness. And rigorous there, we can see, means severe, allowing no abatement. When Lady Mary Chudley writes all his innate rigour shows, I think we can take this to mean rage, cruelty, fury, along with coldness, strictness inflexibility suggests that men have this innately within them and the marriage state encourages that to come out and you are then beholden to this fierce creature who abuses their power and it encourages their cruelty to come out of them. This is a problem facilitated by the law. The well-known phrase is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the same is true in marriage. Giving the husband supreme or absolute power over his wife by law brings out and encourages any latent tyrannical traits within him. Then but to look, to laugh or speak will the nuptial contract break. You can see that there's a half rhyme there only. So by sight, it looks like a rhyme, S-P-E-A-K, B-R-E-A-K. They look as though they will rhyme, but then when you say them, it's only a half rhyme, speak, break, which emphasizes the idea of breaking because the similarity is broken. But it's also quite a difficult line to say. You have to emphasize quite heavily, will the nuptial contract break. It's not a line that rolls off the tongue because it's emphasising the lack of smoothness, the brokenness. Like mutes, she signs alone must make. The idea that women, like children, should be seen and not heard and never any freedom take. The idea of taking freedom I think is interesting. The word take implies almost stealing or taking something which isn't yours as if women don't have any freedom and it's really taking away a woman's voice like mutes she signs alone must make. She's not allowed to speak. 
but still be governed by a nod and fear her husband as her god. And then we have a couplet whose form I think is particularly interesting. And you can see from the repetition in form that echoes the content. It depicts the confinement of such a life. The constraint in form reflects the constraint in life. So the first line of the couplet says what she can do. And the second line says what she cannot do. Him still must serve, him still obey, and nothing act, and nothing say. So we've got lots of repetition here. The still of still serve, still obey, goes back to still be governed by a nod. And the repetition as well of nothing, so which nothing, nothing can divide. So nothing can stop this being able to say nothing and do nothing, nothing act and nothing say. But we really get a sense of the restriction, I think, and how repetitive such a life is through the repetition in the form and the concision, the preciseness, the conciseness in the form of the couplet. But what her haughty lord thinks fit, who with the power has all the wit. And this is really biting criticism or kind of biting sarcasm. The point here is that women are not allowed or not perceived to have any wit because they don't have the power. We now tend to use the word wit to mean the second definition as Johnson defines the word. So imagination or quickness of fancy. When we talk about a witty person, we talk about a funny, quick-witted person. But the primary definition in the 18th century was more to do with intellect. So the powers of the mind, the mental faculties, the intellects. This is the original signification. So if we go back and apply that to the poem there, but what her haughty lord thinks fit who with the power has all the wit. It's beautifully turned phrase there that's suggesting that whoever it is who has the power determines what it is that is deemed to be clever or not. So because the husband has all the power, he is allowed to determine what is considered to be quickness of mind, etc. And because he has all the power, he imagines that he has all the wit and therefore he's a haughty lord who whatever he thinks fit she has to do only because he has the power not because he actually necessarily has any more wit than she does we then come to the final two couplets the final four lines which go back to the idea of this being an address to the ladies so the speaker is speaking again directly to the ladies two single unmarried women then shun oh shun again repetition which we have throughout the poem shun that wretched state and all the fawning flatterers hate value yourselves and men despise you must be proud if you'll be wise the fawning flatterers are lovers coming to pay courtship to women before they're married the speaker of the poem is saying be careful of those fawning flatterers because they might flatter you beforehand but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will continue to flatter you after you're married and remember that when you are married man will be made supreme over the wife and so don't fall for flattery because you have to pay very hard in life for a little bit of casual flattery before you get married. Value yourselves. Now that I think is quite a, a modern turn of phrase and something we would absolutely use in the 21st century and there's a balance between value yourselves here before you get married and remember value yourself because after you get married you will have nothing left but state status and pride and we return to that earlier depiction of state and pride again because those words are picked up in these closing lines wretched state you must be proud and this is valuing yourself now before you get married you must be proud proud of yourself and i think also playing on a different meaning of the word proud that you may not have come across before so returning again to johnson's dictionary we can see there are many definitions of the word pride inordinate and unreasonable self-esteem which is perhaps how we most likely think of the word pride but also if you look down towards the bottom you'll see definition eight the state of a female beast soliciting 
the male. So Lady Mary Chudley is playing on this idea of pride here. You must be proud. If you're a female beast soliciting the male, so you're in this state, this state of pride, you must be proud in the alternative de definition of pride. You must value yourself while you are in this state, while you are soliciting a male companion, if you will be wise. And that's the wise way to think about going into marriage. Use your wit while you still can before it's taken away from you, as it would be if you made a bad choice in who you married. So the men that you are supposed to despise are the fawning flatterers. I think the poem seems incredibly hostile to marriage, and indeed in many ways it is, but I do think we have to think about the tone of the poem. I mean, the line, and men despise, value yourselves and men despise, does seem to be really, really arguing against the state of marriage and criticising men completely. But as I've said, this was a very popular poem and it was popular within the establishment. So I don't think we can read this wholly as or at least that 18th century readers took it wholly as being straightforwardly critical of something so fundamental to the status quo. I think we should also remember before we read the poem biographically, so that's before we read the poem as a direct comment on Lady Mary Chudley's own life, which it often is. So this poem to the ladies is often read as being an indication that her own marriage was incredibly unhappy and so on. But before we do that, we should reflect, I think, on the fact that she would not have been able to publish such a poem at all if her husband was a tyrant in the way that the husband figure is presented in the poem. As we saw earlier, married women were not legally recognised in law. So if a husband did not want his wife to publish a text, it would be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly difficult for her to negotiate publishing a text. Given this, should we then take the tone of the poem to be a tongue in cheek critique, deliberately over the top, a deliberately hyperbolic criticism of the marriage state? Well, yes, I think we can. It's kind of playful in its hyperbole. For example, fear her husband as her God. I think we can see that in some ways as being playful. Because, you know, of course, an individual man is not terribly godlike. But even if it is deliberately hyperbolic in tone and there's this playful sense of over the top imagery and so on, can it still be a straight warning to single ladies to think very carefully about the husband they choose? Yes, I think it can. To warn them against potential dangers, to remind them that when they get married, their husband is legally the head of them and therefore not to fall for any easy fawning flattery, to value themselves far higher than that because they will want to have a husband that values them too. Thank you very much indeed for listening. If you want to support my channel, then do subscribe and give the video a big thumbs up. It means that more people will see my videos. And do let me know what you make of the poem and its tone, its seemingly contradictory tone in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you.